In today's episode, we open our Bibles to Hosea chapter 9. Hosea prophesies a vivid picture of Israel's impending punishment for their unfaithfulness and for their idolatry. He likens them to bad grapes unfit for consumption. He warns them of their impending judgment and fall, highlighting their religious infidelity, their moral wrongdoing during their prosperous period under King Solomon. Good morning and blessed Lenten tide. Today is Thursday, March 16th, and you're listening to Thy Strong Word. Each weekday morning, we explore the holy scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Thy Strong Word is sponsored in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation, a recognized service organization in the LCMS that assists congregations and missionaries in sharing the good news of Jesus through Lutheran materials translated into foreign languages. Visit lhfmissions.org to discover how they can support you in spreading the gospel and to explore their range of offerings. That's lhfmissions.org. Well, Hosea chapters 9 and 10 really form one unit, but today we'll be delving into the first part in chapter 9. And to help us parse God's prophecy here, I'm pleased to have as my guest this morning the Reverend Adam DeGroote, pastor of Calvary Lutheran Church in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. Good morning, Pastor DeGroote. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. It's a pleasure to be back with you, Pastor Boo. Sorry, I got your name wrong there for a second. It, it looks like Groot. People mistake my name all the time with the double O's, so I, t- I hope you'll forgive me. But Pastor DeGroote, last time you were with us, we were studying Exodus. Uh, that's been a few months. How are things going with you and your congregation this Lenten season? Very well. Thank you for asking. Yeah, we uh, we uh, are doing very well, and uh, things are uh, coming out of the to the the lurches of of the the COVID fog in a lot of ways, and and uh, we're we're heading in a really good direction. So, uh, school's going well for for my son Knox, and and hockey's going well as well, uh, going well as well. Uh, and Melissa continues to stay busy with uh, homeschooling and, and various other things. She's uh, very busy at this time, taking care of musicals and hockey practice and soccer practice and all that other sort of stuff. So I don't want to rub it in too much. I know you're up in Minnesota, <laughs> so you guys haven't even started that yet. So oh, it's it. it's going very well. Oh, that's wonderful, though. Well, I'll tell you what, we have a lot to cover today. We don't have a ton of verses, but they're really deep and rich in what they're pointing to, what they're pointing back to. Uh, obviously, this prophecy of God is a, it's a pretty important one. Lots of law this Lenten season so far as we've been going through the book of Hosea. But you know what? That's okay, because the law of God is good and wise. Before we get into it, though, I'd like to invite you to begin our time together in prayer. Pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our benefit. Most especially, you have given us the proper distinction of law and gospel. So as we delve into your holy word in the ninth chapter of Hosea, so send your Holy Spirit that we may rightly discern your law and your gospel, your word of truth, that we may see of your great mercy in showing us our grave sin, and uh, also that you would reveal to us through uh, these words of stern law how your mercy is made known each day through the forgiveness of sins. So be with Pastor Boo and me this day. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we are in chapter 9. Yesterday, we didn't have a show because it was preempted by some Lenten worship that's happening on KFU on Wednesdays. So it's been a couple of days since uh, our audience has been in the text that might be a good idea, if you don't mind, just catch us up. Where, where have we been so that we know where we're going? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's a, it, not to give a world, I guess it's a whirlwind two words. It's Hosea's called, of course, as a prophet of God. He's a, uh, set aside specifically to give the, the word of truth to the people of uh, the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, he marries a prostitute named Gomer, which is an amazing thing. Uh, but, and I think in a lot of ways is very indicative of of how it is that uh, Christ comes to uh, his bride, the church. Uh, we are an unlovely, uh, an unlovely creature for sure. Uh, but yet our Lord comes and marries us uh, by virtue of his death and his blood for us on the cross. He makes us beautiful through his blood. Uh, and the other thing too, that is, it really is important, especially as we, as we go through uh, Hosea in terms of what the prophets are doing is, is they're not, not necessarily foretelling the future. Um, but they've been given as heralds of God's word. And and so, you know, Hosea is sent uh, by Yahweh, who loves his people, uh, sent for the very specific purpose of of turning them in repentance. And that's, of course, done through the preaching of the law. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so he, here he is 
here he is uh, going to the people of the Northern Kingdom. And of course, as we know for, for the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah, um, and as Jesus says, as he enters into um, Jerusalem, as Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the place that the, uh, the prophets are killed, et cetera, so on. They do not hear the word of God. And of course, that, uh, that, that same sort of plight uh, comes for Hosea. But I think the important thing, especially as we're getting into chapter 9, is, is really in light of what we understand in terms of the Bible altogether, is that, you know, it's a forensic book in a lot of ways. And I don't mean that in the sense that it's a law book. What we see is that, we, is that God is, is, is dealing with his people who have fallen into grave sin. And the, and, the, and the primary thing that he's doing is to, to reveal uh, where they have sinned, where they have fallen short, and to show them how, how dire this sin is for them, that it's actually not just causing uh, you know, some terrible things in their temporal lives, but this is, this is terrible in terms of, of their relationship with Yahweh, the triune God, um, and uh, the gods that they are giving themselves over to, the false gods they're giving themselves over to, while they think that they're you know, meriting great benefits as a result of this, in reality, are actually uh, very detrimental to the people uh, of the northern kingdom of Israel. So here's Hosea in chapter nine, and he's foretelling how it is that the Assyrians are going to be coming in, or they're going to come in the year 722, um, and they're basically going to annihilate uh, the, the entirety of the of the northern kingdom. But one of the things I think is so important, specifically um, as we're, we're we're getting into chapter nine, is to remember is that you know this is it is a law heavy chapter. This particular chapter isn't so much focused on how you or I would look at the law, because a lot of times I think, Pastor, but we look at the second table of the law, you know, loving our neighbor, uh, not stealing, not murdering, those sorts of things like that. And those are important. But, but this particular chapter, I think, really gets us oriented in terms of the first table of the law. You know, why is it that God has given us to only worship one God? Why is it that we're, we're not to misuse the name of the Lord our God, but to call upon it in prayer and praise and thanksgiving, all those things. And why is it that our work, we're, we're given to remember the Sabbath day and it holy? And I think that's what we see here in, in chapter 9 is that, you know, Hosea, sent by God, who loves his people, is there precisely because he loves these people so much and wishes for them to be turned from their, their, their idolatry, is, is a simple way to put it. Hosea actually calls it whoredom. Um, and that's a very strong word. This is a very, very pointed um, chapter. Um, but of course, uh, the prophet is pulling no punches out of great care and out of great love uh, for the people of God. So that kind of gets us caught up to speed with what's what's you know preceded, um, you know, in the in the in the chapters before chapters one through eight, and chapter nine. Really, I think the other thing too, and I wanted to highlight this as well, is that you know, I think Hosea really is laid out for us very well chronologically. Um, the first three chapters are, are talking about um, uh, Hosea and Gomer and then Gomer's children and, and the names that go with those kids uh, are indicative of what's going to befall Israel in, in a lot of ways, and it's very dire. But then God goes in from chapter four um, and he's really bringing three charges uh, against his people. So they're indictments, but with the indictments will come condemnation. But also we have to remember, and this is where the gospel comes in, is that God is doing, indicting, and condemning the people in order that they might be given pardon, most specifically through the forgiveness of sins, which, which comes from God and God alone. So the, the things that God is, or that Yahweh is condemning the people of is rejecting the knowledge of God. And that's not knowledge in the sense of book knowledge. You know, it's a knowledge in the sense that, you know, um, as fathers know, you know, as husbands know their wives, we know them intimately. So what's happened is as, as the Israelites have, have fallen into this false worship, you know, it's not that they've failed to know who God is. They've, they've come to know him in a different way. They know him as evil and wretched and, and, and a tyrant and one who wants to punish them. And they, on the other hand of that, they've come to understand and to know false gods as ones that they think are taking care of them and are giving them temporal gifts and bread for their own bellies. The section we're going to be talking about today is where you actually see that the people of God have been rejecting his mercy. Now, that's a strange thing to think about because, you know, well, who amongst us would, would reject the mercy of God? And the answer is in our sinful nature, all of us. And we reject the mercy of God because oftentimes we're led to believe by the temptations of the evil one. And I think that's the beauty of Lent is that, you know, Lent is not saying, you know, we're repenting of our sins as, as, as you know, confession that is, is mandated. We are given the great gift of confession in order that we might know that we're confessing our sins to a merciful God. 
So that's the hard thing for the people of Israel is that, you know, as they've fallen into this false worship, as they've fallen into the worship of Baal and sexual immorality and all these different things, they look at their lives and they say, well, everything's good. Everything's wonderful. Um, no problems here. And we see this later on in the cha- in the, in the, in the book of Jeremiah is the prophet Jeremiah is saying, beware of those and, and preach against those who are saying peace, peace when there is no peace. And that's really what's happening here with, with Hosea. There's no peace here amongst you, amongst you people, because peace comes only from God. You're rejecting the mercy of God because the mercy of God is known chiefly in the forgiveness of sins. And I think that's one of the things we know so well as Lutherans is, you know, we see, we hear Jesus talking to the Pharisees and the scribes concerning this, you know, he says, go and find out what this means. I desire, and the actual, I think, literal interpretation says, I desire to be merciful and not sacrifice. And so we know that Jesus is the perfect Passover lamb. This is what we talked about last time we were together with the Passover. Jesus is the propitiation. He's the perfect sacrificial lamb, and he desires nothing more, one, to hear us, uh, to have us call out to him, and he desires to give and to always love us, and he desires to love us most specifically in the mercy that he shows for us in the forgiveness of our sins. So that's kind of where we're going to be today as we go through Hosea chapter 9. I think you've done a good job of summarizing everything up for us, which I definitely appreciate. Uh, but I will say this, I, you know, give us a little bit of background about, before we dig into the text, uh, about what's going on in terms of this idea that they're in a time of prosperity yeah. and maybe how that connects to the prosperity that we're experiencing today. I mean, you rightly said that, you know, the this isn't really necessarily about how we interpret the law, but at the same time, a lot of the things that are happening then, I think, connect to today because of some similar circumstances. What really is the difference between the people of the Northern Kingdom and the people of America in 2023? And I think if we if we sort of boil it down to, to basic human understanding, basic human need, you know, they were in need of charity, of love, of of connection with one another, of of their temple, of 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 being able to be a part of a community. Um, and 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 the similarities of the Northern Kingdom and ours is that you know. You know, as and we see this all the way back to the book of Numbers, when when the people are coming out of the Exodus, one of the first things that they do, and this is what we'll be reminded of in our text today, is, you know, here's God who's been faithful to his people through the Exodus. But what's one of the first things they do as they come out of the Exodus is they start to, they fall into false worship um, and start offering sacrifices to Baal and, and the sexual immorality comes with that. And I, and I think that's one of the things, you know, to speak very frank, you know, that is a, a profound similarity of their day and our day in the sense that um, not all, but many of the sins that we see in our modern day are tied in, in some way, shape, or form to um, sex and to marriage and to gender and to um, you know, our identity of, of what it means to be a human being. And, and I think you know, one of the things that, you know, how do you say, I mean, as the devil tempts us, um, he has no promises and he can create nothing. We know this, but what the devil will always, you know, will always attach is to say, well, there, there is some temporal good that comes as a result of this. There is some payoff that will come. And we see that in the first verse of our book uh, of chapter nine is that, you know, they were really believing one, that they were doing the right worship. They were performing all the right sacrifices. They were, you know, in other words, they were following the book, you know, in terms of what they believed God had said that they should be doing. The problem was they were, they believed that by doing the right things that God was merciful to them. Now, of course, that means that for, that forego is in the person in the, in the mind of the people of northern of northern Israel that God was always merciful. In other words, we don't do anything to make Him merciful; He just is. And I think that's one of the things that's so strange is that you know, but in order for Him to be merciful, that also means that He has to be merciful about something. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's the difficult thing. And I don't know about, you know, the rest of the listeners or even you, Pastor but I, Boo, but I can speak for myself. Um, for me to, 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 to say out loud that I am in desperate need of mercy means that I am in need of saving from something. And, and this is what Hosea brings, brings, brings to the front. You are in need of being saved from yourself, from your own false worship from the ways that you think that you are making God in your own image. And, and in, in that, just those three things that I've mentioned there, you can see how it is that, you know, I, I pastored a Grotem in violation 
of many uh, of, of the laws that God gives us in the Decalogue. Um, but thanks be to God that, that Yahweh is sending Hosea just the same as he sends you to Laverne, just right. the same as he sends me, just as he sends our listeners, pastors to them, to be able to be reminded that our prophets, the prophets are not, you know, uh, you know, like I said, future tellers. They're the ones who are proclaiming the word of God. We know what the future holds because of what our Lord has said to us. And the future is one that is much like the present. It is filled with mercy and kindness and forgiveness of sins, life and salvation. That's the beauty of it all. And that's the thing we can't lose focus on as we go through these chapters, specifically 9 and 10. Well, and that is the the hope that we must keep focused on as we dive into what is essentially extremely clear, uh, savage in some ways, law that is mm-hmm. so direct that it is meant to cut right down to the bone. And we're going to read that. I think I'm going to read verses 1. Uh, it, it seems natural through 4 for some reason. We'll see, we'll see how we do with that. So I'll be reading 1 through 4, chapter 9 from the ESV. Rejoice not, O Israel. Exult not like the peoples, for you have played the whore, forsaking your God. You have loved a prostitute's wages on all threshing floors. Threshing floor and wine vat shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail them. They shall not remain in the land of Yahweh, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt, and they shall eat unclean foods in Assyria. They shall not pour drink offerings of wine to Yahweh, and their sacrifices shall not please him. It shall be like mourner's bread to them. All who eat of it shall be defiled, for their bread shall be for their hunger only. It shall not come to the house of Yahweh. So we um, rejoice not. Don't be happy. You, you mentioned that at the very beginning, right? Don't be happy because, well, you've, and to use the biblical language, you've played the whore. That's, uh, yeah. that's strong. That's strong. It is. Well, and, and I think about this, you know, you know, and in, in, in maybe in my younger days where I was a little more precocious is that, you know, I'd be sat down in the principal's office and, and the principal would come and I was giggling and laughing over the fact that, I, you know, I, had, I had put a thumbtack on the teacher's chair. Um, but of course, that is not a time for rejoicing. Right. And now we're dealing with somebody here who is, he's the author and the, and the, the, the author and the creator of life. He's the first and the last, the alpha and the omega. And he's coming to them and he's through Hosea saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to sit you down here. And the first thing I'm going to say is that this is not a time for rejoicing in any way, shape, or form. And, and, and this really, I think, sort of sets us up for um, this, the very season that we're in. You know, the season of Lent is a season that's really uh, set aside as a season of fasting. Uh, fasting and, 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 and contemplation of who we are and, and, and how desperately we're in need of our Lord. And, and that's, that's sort of the tone that we have that Yahweh's setting through Hosea. Sit down here and listen to the prophet that I've given to you. You will not have joy, and, and most specifically, will not be like the joy of the others, because the reality is, is that the others who, who are, 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 are seeming to have joy um, really only have joy in, in the fact that their grain and their wine is abounding, for lack of a better word. So in other words, God does give you temporal things. And he is the author and the perfecter of this. And we'll see this as we go through the chapter. But um, the joy that, the, that you see the people who are worshiping Baal having is not a real joy in the least. It's a happiness at best that is contingent. And this is what we see in that second part. For you have played the harlot against your God. You have made love for hire on everything and on every threshing floor. And so <clears throat> what he's saying here is that these threshing floors... Um, which, of course, you know, I mean, anybody who lives in rural America understands that threshing floor is the place that the harvest comes. This, this theme of harvest is really prominent in this particular chapter. So on the threshing floor, you would be able to see that, you know, what looked like, you know, full grain heads. Well, okay, on the threshing floor, you'd be able to see as the harvest full as the harvest light. But the other thing that's so important to understand is historically in the northern kingdom, what also happened on the threshing floor is that these were places of Baal worship by the people of God. Um, and on these threshing floors, um, their idolatry knew no bounds. And then what we see is their idolatry, they were worshiping these false gods, and this love for higher section here is saying, well, basically, you're doing this and believing these harvests have come because Baal has been generous to you. So the harvest is plentiful because the gods have smiled on you. And we see that in our own day. 
is, you know, this idea of karma, which we as Lutherans, as Christians, we don't believe in. Right. It's, it's not that good comes to good people or bad comes to bad people. The catechism is very clear about this, is that our Lord makes the rain fall on the just and the unjust. And that's exactly what he's saying here, is I'm coming to you, my people. There is not joy in this false worship that you will have with these people of Baal, but I am coming to give you great joy and I'm coming to give you mercy. If only you will see that you are in need of this mercy that I give to you. And so then that's the thing that he says then in chapter two, or rather verse two, the threshing floor and the wine press shall, shall not feed them and the new wine shall fail here. So in other words, basically they were falsely believing that Baal had given the harvest to them, but in reality, Yahweh was the one that gave it to them. Right. And yet, though they fail to see this, they are going to still be given this harvest, but what's going to be hap- what's going to happen is there's going to be things that are going to be taken away from them. Namely, um, all these threshing floors, all of these temples. And one of the other things to remember about what was happening in the Northern Kingdom is, you know, they were very religious people in the sense that, you know, the Jews were very religious people in the sense that they were building false uh, altars to Baal all over the Northern Kingdom. And so these threshing floors where they were finding, you know, such, you know, what they said was joy are going to be destroyed because basically God's going to be sending them into, into exile or into captivity that this time uh, at the hands of the Assyrians. And that's what verse three is saying. Okay. What's going to happen to you as I am seeking to turn you from your sin is you're not going to dwell in, 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 in the Lord's land. Um, now remember, and this is what's so important to remember is that people, as much as we as Americans think about this, you know, this land is your land, this man land is my mm-hmm. land, this land was made for you and me. That's sort of the way that we think about things. And that's the way they thought about it back then. But Yahweh sets them straight and he says, no, this land is my land, which I have given to you as a great gift. And yet this gift that I have given to you, you have failed to see the gift that I have given to you. You have started to worship the gift over the giver. Now the result is going to be Ephraim. Ephraim is basically the name that, that Yahweh gives to the northern kingdom of Israel. But Ephraim was also one of the strongest of, you know, he, he it was understood as one of the strongest tribes of Israel. What's interesting here is that Ephraim is going to be returned to Egypt. They'll eat unclean things in Assyria. And I've got a number of different notes, you know, concerning that particular verse, but just, just the first two, first two verses, what Yahweh's doing is, is sort of setting them down and, 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 and sort of not so subtly but very mercifully saying to them, this is what's going to happen to you. It's going to be for your benefit in order that you would see your error. And in seeing your error, that you would see that I am still merciful to you. I will be merciful to you, even though you're going to be thrown into captivity with the Assyrians. Um, and, you know, um, verse four is talking about this too, is that they're not going to offer wine offerings to the Lord, nor shall their sacrifices be pleasing to him. And this this kind of goes back to what we we understand in terms of okay, well, why why could this be? Is that you know there's there's certain stipulations given in the in the book of Deuteronomy, where it's saying okay, it has to do with the the fir- the, the fruits and the first fruits of, of what the Lord gives. There's not going to be crops that are going to be harvested from the land that's there. Um, there's no sacrifices that they're going to offer that are going to be appeasing to God. Um, there's going to be way, grain and wine, but the but it's not going to be um, uh, of any benefit to them in terms of sacrifice. But it will be good for their bellies, even though they continue to be, uh, you know, not sojourners, but really dispersed into the land of, of Egypt. So one of the things that stands out to me as I look at it, really more from a surface level too, is that there's this undoing of this rescue that he brought them out of Egypt. Now they're going to yep. return to Egypt. It, 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 re- it really recalls for me this idea that people take for granted that the things that make them happy in this life are not from the false gods that people are so eager to devote themselves to, but ultimately from God. And really, that's nothing new because we see that happening here with Israel, and God is basically like, I'm going to take that stuff away. And, and, and yeah. I don't want it to come to that. And I think of those Christians, Christians, mind you, who are so faithful to the Lord at the beginning— you know, and then their their faithfulness becomes fickle as it does with all of us, and perhaps they become unfaithful, and then something happens. They lose their job, they lose their spouse, they become sick, they have a disease, something happens, and then they 
suddenly have all their priorities straightened or they, a, they quote, realize what's more important. But ultimately, God takes away things that draws them back. And I don't think that God wants it to get to that level, but he does because he loves us, just as he loves Israel, even though they're unfaithful. Right. Well, and, 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 and strangely, and, and, it's, and I know it sounds strange to, to hear this. It certainly, I remember the first time I said this, it was strange to say is that, you know, here's God coming to them and revealing to them that they're slaves, not just slaves, but they're harlots. They're chasing mm-hmm. after false husbands, false gods, believing that these false gods give them, give them good things. The reality is, is that, is that these false gods know them. They know them in wicked and awful and evil ways. So the strange thing is this. They loved their slavery. They loved their slavery. And though, and this is the thing that I think really verse three and four really articulate for us, is that though they will be slaves and captives, they will still continue to be watched over by Yahweh. His mercies are going to be for them. He's going to continue to love them, though they continue to insist on being slaves. And we'll see this later in the chapter where we we go back to the references Specifically, the First Samuel um, chapter thirteen, where where it, you know, but you know, Saul, Saul was a terrible king, and and you know, like I said, we'll get into this, but but you see, um, there they they've got these these places of worship in in a place that's not Jerusalem. They continue to go there, uh, even though the temple's built there, and I, I think that's the nature of what what God is orienting His people to ultimately here is that, um, God wishes to be sought where he can be found. Where does he say that he can be found? Well, he can be found tabernacling with us. He can be found with us in the temple. He can be found with us giving the good gifts of forgiveness, life, and salvation. The sacrifices you know, were of, of, of no merit in terms of salvation, but it was for the people that they might see that there was one who took their sin and carried that sin unto death. And of course, all of this points us to the Passover lamb. And most specifically, the Passover lamb, who is Jesus Christ, our Lord. I think that's a good place for us to take just a minute and pause. Folks, don't go anywhere. When we come back, Pastor DeGroat and I will continue with Hosea chapter 9. We'll see you on the other side. On America's college campuses, doors are open to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. The number of international students studying at American schools has more than quadrupled over the past decade. For many of these young men and women, it's their first time living in a free society where they can ask questions about Christianity. You can help answer their questions. Go to lhfmissions.org and partner with the Lutheran Heritage Foundation to translate good Lutheran books into languages these students can read and understand. lhfmissions.org Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo, and with me today is the Reverend Adam DeGro, pastor of Calvary Lutheran Church in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. Friends at home, as we delve deeper into the Word of God, I hope that you're finding our program both enriching and enlightening. If you have any feedback, questions, or thoughts, be sure to reach out to me at pastorboo at gmail.com, or you can connect with me on Facebook. As always, you can catch Thy Strong Word by tuning in on the radio if you're in the St. Louis area, or by listening on kfuo.org on demand. And if you're always on the move like I am, you can stay up to date by downloading the KFUO app or subscribing to Thy Strong Word on your favorite podcasting platform. Either way, I'm just grateful and honored to have you with us for our study this morning. And if you are so led, be sure to share the program and the many ways to listen with your friends and your family. Well, Pastor DeGroat, before the break, we were um, just getting through verse 4. It's probably a good idea to get some more verses on the table. Um, I'd like to read verses all the way through verse, hmm, let's do verse 9, just to get another big chunk of verses. Here we go. Starting with verse 5. What will you do on the day of the appointed festival and on the day of the feast of Yahweh? For behold, they are going away from destruction. But Egypt shall gather them, Memphis shall bury them, nettles shall possess their precious things of silver, thorns shall be in their tents. The days of punishment have come, the days of recompense have come, Israel shall know it. 
The prophet is a fool. The man of the spirit is mad because of your great iniquity and great hatred. The prophet is the watchman of Ephraim with my God. Yet a fouler snare is on all his ways and hatred in the house of his God. They have deeply corrupted themselves as in the day of Gibeah. He will remember their iniquity. He will punish their sins. Okay, brother, help us understand that, right? So he says, what will you do on the day of the appointed festival, the feast of the Lord? Um, what is he talking about? You know, special times of the year, uh, you know, they're different. What's going on? Yeah, no, this is, I mean, we, we begin here and how you end it there is that, you know, um, he will remember their iniquity. He will punish their sins. I mean, yikes. Right. Uh, oh, yes. You know, what we hear by the grace of God in our Lutheran churches on every every Lord's Day that we're there is he will not remember our sin and he will not remember our iniquity. But it, so this really, verse five sets us up for this, is that remember, okay, what always precedes feasts would be fasts. And so, uh, you know, the the prophet is asking here and saying, okay, the appointed day, well, what is the appointed day? Most specifically, it's it's talking about the day that's appointed by God for a specific purpose. And in 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 in, in you know, Jewish culture, this is specifically referencing the Feast of Booths. But to understand this, well, what is a feast for? So feasts were commemorating all that God gave uh, to his people. Um, but now this mercy will be cut off for they are people who have said that they do not need God and is hesed. That's the Hebrew word. So they're saying, I don't need the mercy that God gives, which is a very, very strange thing to be saying to God. Because the, ta- the, the feast that's being talked about here is specifically the Feast of Booths, as mentioned before. And so this was a, a harvest festival, um, uh, which was basically, uh, they were going on pilgrimage, residing in booths, and it was a day of great rejoicing because it was remembering of, 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 of how it was that the Lord had gathered up his harvest. He was faithful to his people. So what's, what's happening here is, and I think this is an interesting thing, and maybe just an aside, I don't have a whole lot of notes on this, is that um, some scholars have, have made mention is that, uh, you know, this particular feast of booths um, coincides with um, the fall festival where uh, some people say that Jesus was born during the Feast of Booths. Now, of course, we as Christians, we celebrate Christmas on the 25th of December, but we have some reason to believe that, okay, that Jesus was born during the Feast of the Festival of Booths. Um, one, the shepherds would have still been in the fields during the Feast of Booths, uh, whereas later in the year, they would have uh, taken their flocks in from the winter, et cetera, so on. But then also, John, St. John writes about this in the first chapter of his gospel, and he says that God is tabernacling with us. And I don't think there's a coincidence in terms of the just or the, 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 the use of words that John has there. God tabernacles with us. And I think that's the important thing to remember is that, you know, here are these people trying to build up these kingdoms, trying to have all the riches of, of this earth. But God, through his feasts, is reminding them that, no, he's the one that provides all these great things. He's the one that provides all these great kings and these great gifts. But not only that, he is the one that continues to abide to tabernacle with his people. Um, but what we see here is that, it, and, and that's then quickly followed by verse 6, where it says, this, this sort of this language of mercy uh, in verse 5 sort of gives way to, but you don't see me as merciful. And how I know that you don't see me as merciful is you're going to run away from me. <laughs> right. You're going to run away from me to the land of Egypt. And, and so Egypt will, will, will gladly welcome you. And then Memphis, this reference to Memphis isn't Memphis, Tennessee. <laughs> Memphis is, yeah, Memphis is, is a place that, you know, all good Jews, all good Israelites rather would have known. Memphis was the place that was known for their pyramids, one, but two, it was known most prominently for its graveyards. So what Yahweh is saying is Egypt will gather you up, but it will gather you up into death. You are going to run away from me, and in running away from me, you will find only death. So what we see is this idea of not running away from him in his mercy, but confiding in him, confessing their sins, being turned from their sins, that they might see that God is merciful to them. Um, so, you know, what's going to happen down there? The nettles will possess their valuables of silver. If you've ever been stung by a stinging nettle, it's a, boy, it's a painful thing. And it doesn't last just for a day. It lasts for two or three. Thorns will be their tents. In other words, um, you know, if the Lord's going to tabernacle with them, as John says, 
now it's juxtaposed to this idea that you will find no rest because even in your beds, there will be thorns and there will be comfort even in your resting. And then this goes to chapter or verse seven. The days of punishment have come and the days of recompense have come. Okay, and this sort of brings us back to verse one. But of course, this is juxtaposed for us as Christians um, to the punishment and the recompense that was poured out onto Jesus. He has taken our punishment. He is the recompense of the Lord. He does not come to judge us, but he comes to fulfill the law and to be judged by God for us. And so this is what Yahweh, who is, you know, I think there's good reason to believe that Yahweh is the second, the pre-incarnate second person of the Trinity, is this particular verse is juxtapo- juxtapos- juxtapositioning the punishment and recompense that will come as a result of, of, of their not listening to Yahweh and juxtaposed to the atonement um, that Christ will win for us on the cross as he faces the wrath of God as the Passover lamb. And this is the thing, the interesting thing that, that, that then Hosea says, Israel knows this. How do they know this? And they know this because the prophet Hosea has been telling them. And because the prophet Hosea has been telling them, they know that Yahweh has been very clear with them. So in other words, though they have been unfaithful, God continues to be faithful to them. But then you'll see sort of the lament of, of Hosea. Uh, the prophet is a fool. So Hosea is saying, you are accounting me as a fool, really kind of as a madman, as a guy who's lost his smarts. <laughs> because here I am, Hosea, telling you that there really is no peace when you're living in the land of, of what you think is luxury and joy and, and all of these, these things that temporally um, the world is saying leads to success. And you're calling God's prophet a fool. The spiritual man is insane is just simply to say, it's kind of like what we see with the prophet Jeremiah. And I think it's chapter 19 where, where, where Jeremiah says it would have been better if I wouldn't have been born. And he doesn't mean it in the sense that he wishes he was dead. What he means is that I continue to speak of mercy to you, but you do not need it. You do not want it. Um, so how Hosea is at his wits end on account of the people in the Israel uh, and of Israel's sin, which they refuse to see. Um, and then the, this goes back, uh, verse 8 is talking about the call that Hosea has, the watchman. And this goes back to Ezekiel as well. Um, Hosea is a true prophet. He's been sent by God for the mercy of God to be given to his people. Um, so Hosea is the watchman of Ephraim. And he's with my God. This word with is kind of an interesting one because it's sort of juxtaposed to he's not against God. And we see this most specifically in, in the book of Revelation where we understand the Antichrist. In other words, Ephraim is speaking everything that God has given him to speak. Um, but the prophet is a fowler snare in all his ways. So in other words, Hosea is feeling like the people are trying to trap him. An enmity that is, you know, uh, this goes back to the, to the, to the Garden of Eden. Uh, enmity between the man or between the woman's seed and the, and the serpent is this, this antagonism, this anger. And this is exactly what the people of God have against God. They have enmity against him because he says he's merciful but they say that they don't need it. And so this enmity is in the house of God because the house of God has been given to basically provide this mercy to them, but yet they, they, they're they using it in, in ways that they shouldn't be using it. And then verse nine, they're deeply corrupted as in the days of Gibeah. And if you want to get a reading of, of the days of Gibeah, you go back to the book of Judges, specifically chapters 19 and 20, where you know you, you see the Benjaminites. Um, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's a regrettable story. Um, because the Benjaminites basically um, uh, seek out a, 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 a basically a, a concubine, uh, uh, and they have their way with her um, throughout the night, and, and then ultimately this 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 uh, concubine is you know killed, and, and then is split up into twelve different pieces, and then is sent to every tribe of the nation of Israel, and this mm, is a great right. time of shame for the for the people of Israel. And that's why it is that Yahweh is saying, or rather Hosea is saying here, it will for it will be for you, people of the northern kingdom, as it was in the days of Gibeah. In other words, not a day of great glory, not a day of great, you know, pomp and circumstance, but but you have brought great shame upon yourself. Um and 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 you have done this simply by virtue of 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 ceasing to listen to Yahweh who continues to come to you. And bestow love and mercy to you. It's 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 a very powerful section here, uh, which then gives way in the next verses to to Yahweh speaking to the people um, yeah. in ten through thirteen. 
And we will read those in a moment. I want to focus on two things, though, or bring back up what you brought up. Um, first is the idea of the prophet is a fool, the man of the spirit is mad because of your great iniquity and great hatred. So you said that that is, um, that's Hosea basically speaking of how he's being treated. Yeah. And I think that's something that even the average Christian can really identify with because as we go off into the world and we try to just proclaim the simple and clear word of God, we're not even going around calling everyone harlots and whores, right? We're just right. Right. we're just saying things like, um, you know, God has created men to be men and women to be women and simple things. And we are the ones who are considered foolish and backwards and mad. Um, you know, I, I just feel like there's a connection there between what even the average everyday Christian faces and what the prophet of God faces as he strives to be faithful and yet everyone's against him. It's very true. Right. It, it, and, and, you know, you, you see, Yet you see, though, and this goes back to what 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 Jose is saying there back in in um, oh, well, actually, he says it in verse eight is that you know, well, how do you know that that, that a true prophet has been sent to you? Um, I've been given to watch over you, not to watch over you like a babysitter or a, you know a, a tyrant or a dictator. It's not it's not about that at all. And I, that's the unfortunate thing is we know in in this day and age. And then we don't know. I mean, we we know we're in the last days. We don't know whether we're in the last little season of the devil now. We we may be. We don't know. We know what will happen uh, for us in terms of great mercy and, and love from from our Lord. Um, but this idea is that you know what is what God says to us most specifically with regard to our true identity as human beings, man and woman, man and woman. He created them. He created them in His image. You know. Um, in 2023, this is not accepted as as um, uh, as truth anymore. Um, and then I think that's the great bane of what the devil does. Is he's he's here making that which is evil appear to be good, and that which is good appear to be evil. And that's the thing you see as the, as you see that you know um, they're going to run away from Yahweh because they do not believe he's merciful. They believe that he's come to 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 judge them unjustly. And I think that's the bane of, of the time that we're living in is, 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 you know, and this goes back to the Grammys. Um, what an abomination right. in many ways, because, um, you know, what, what I think we're seeing in our day is, um, the devil himself, uh, making it appear as if God is the enemy of his people and that we are in the endeavor of trying and to seek to be free from him. And that's what verse six really addresses. You will seek to be free from me, but I'm asking you why. I want to be merciful to you. I am slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, but yet I will allow you. I will allow you to, to flee. Not only that, I will send the Assyrians. <laughs> mm -hmm. I will send the Assyrians, which, which in many ways will prompt you to do this. But it, though it may prompt them to do it, what they see with their eyes, the Assyrians coming, um, what they're failing to trust is that God will protect them. And I think that's what you see when we get to, and I can't remember where it is specifically. It's when, oh yeah, it is. It's verse 12. Verse 12 really articulates this, where Yahweh finally says, woe will come to you when I depart from them. That's well, what, an amazing, amazing well, thing. Yeah, we'll get to that in just a little bit, but yeah, yeah. it's it's amazing. Well, why don't we get to it, to it now? I'll just go ahead and add those verses. So let's add verses sure. 10, 11, 12. Oh, let's say all the way through the 14. That'll just give us a sure. few more. Here we go. Like grapes in the wilderness, I found Israel. Like the first fruit on the fig tree in its first season, I saw your fathers. But they came to Baal Peor and consecrated themselves to the thing of shame and became detestable like the thing they loved. Ephraim's glory shall fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, no conception. Even if they bring up children... I will bereave them till none is left. Woe to them when I depart from them. Ephraim, as I have seen, was like a young palm planted in a meadow, but Ephraim must lead his children out to slaughter. Give them, O Yahweh, what will you give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. Okay, it just gets worse in terms of the consequences of their unfaithfulness. But, but 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 don't we hear it in 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 verse ten though, Pastor Boo? You know, it's kind of like a Valentine card, right? Mm -hmm. Here's Yahweh speaking of his people. 
And you hear this great fondness, this love that he has, almost like he's never seen them before. Like he's seeing, you know, the, 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 the woman of his dreams for the first time. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness, and I saw your fathers as the first, first fruits on the fig tree in its first season. It's beautiful, beautiful language. And what, and what Yahweh is doing here is he's saying to, to the people how much he adores them and loves them, and, and yet, and, and not just that, but how he's taken them through the wilderness, how he's been with them through the captivity, how waters come from the rock, how man has come to them, and they've been taken from the slavery of Egypt. But then what you see in this, the reference here is to Numbers 25. Yeah. <laughs> and I laugh, not because it's funny necessarily, but because one of the first things that happens as they are led out of this and as God has continued to be faithful to them, what do they do? They turn to another bridegroom. They are adulterous. They turn to, ba to Baal Peor. Um, and this is the first instance of Baal worship. Um, and Israel joined with the Moabites in worshiping Baal. A and so you see is that, you know, these people that Yahweh has loved and cared for are now turning from him. And, and, and what they're doing is by doing so, they're separating themselves to that shame. So in other words, from Yahweh comes goodness, promise, knowledge, mercy, all these wonderful things. But what's come is shame. So ba uh, Baal Peor provided nothing but false worship. So it, it, it gave them something. It gave them a, a false God to, to worship to or whatever it happens to be. And this goes back to, I think, what we understand in our divine service is that, you know, you really begin to have the image of the thing that you worship. And, and I think that's the thing that you see there in the last part of this. They became an abomination like the thing they loved. Hmm. So in other words, they became like inanimate objects. They became as ones who were dead. Uh, they, they believed they were strong when in reality they were weak. They believed they were beautiful and when in reality they were making themselves um, harlots and prostitutes. And they were willingly doing so and wanting to do so because they saw the benefits of it um, quickly and, and they were welcomed by their community. And, and then, you know, this thing, you know, in verse 11 is that, you know, as for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird. Um, so they were once great, a great people, um, well-renowned by all of the nations of the earth, and the glory was fast fleeting from them. And so what happens then is that you see this, it's a strange order in verse 11. So it's, it's sort, of, sort of the birth process in reverse. So there'll be no birth, no pregnancy, no conception. So in other words, only death and destruction is going to come by virtue of their false worship. Um, and I will give them over to this. I think that's the most stark thing that Yahweh is saying. I'm not giving it to you necessarily, but I'm allowing yourself to be given over to it. And, and, and that's, uh, that's a distinction that I, I, I don't think we can underestimate because we, th we see this throughout the entirety of the Old Testament uh, and even, even the New as well, um, uh, that, that God um, is, is loving and then giving to give us over to the thing that we love. But that's the beauty is that, you know, like I said before, we become like the thing that we love. God has given them a temple. God has given them a priest. God has given them words to tell them who they are, what their identity is. And it goes back to what you had mentioned, Pastor Boo, is that, you know, as we live in a world that, you know, that continues to say that a, that a man isn't a man and a woman isn't a woman, my gosh, um, we're really falling headlong into that. Um, with, with some really, you know, the temporal results maybe are that we're accepted or not canceled or or whatever it happens to be. But the reality is, is that the joy then is stripped away from us because we're losing the connection that we have to the word of God that tells us who we actually are. Well, I don't um, want to, I don't want to make yeah. too much of a connection about it either, but we often today think when we read these types of declarations of law, it's easy to connect them to the specific Baals and all these other things. But the, the fact is the false idols as a catechism, so uh, you know, eloquently puts, they, they aren't just these things made of wood and stone, but rather yeah. it's whatever we put our faith, hope, and trust in. And so people are marrying themselves, connecting to themselves to many things, which are things of shame this, this day. But I couldn't help but connect, and I'm not trying to make everything about this, but when we talk sure. about the LGBT, LGBTQ issues and some other things, these are things that are so contrary to God's design that there cannot be birth, pregnancy, conception. They, yep. And it says even if they bring up children, 
you know, then even the ones that are that are around won't be will be harmed by it. Let's make it real soft like that. So, sure. So the point is, and I'm not that's just sort of a very obvious one, but there's so many sins and false idols that we can get into that it's against what God wants for us and therefore it uh, it ruins our lives, even if we think we get some temporal or temporary pleasure from it. Sure. Yeah. And, and, and you know, and, and like I said, it seems it seems good for an instant, but we have to remember we're dealing with with Yahweh, who who does, of course, give things for an instance, food for our bodies, you know, food, shelter, and all that other sort of stuff. He does that. But our Lord is is dealing in the realm of the eternal, right? Eternal love, eternal kindness, eternal good, eternal benevolence, and that's the thing too is that you know. In, in the case of, of you know, the, the, the subject that is, is prominent in our day is to say, you know, God doesn't love a, a gay person or a lesbian because they are that, although the world would say that we love them because of their identity. Right. God loves them because of the identity that they have as a redeemed sinner. The problem is, is that we fail to see that these things are sin. All of us are guilty. None of us has, 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 has not sinned. And I think that's the great thing, the great hope that we can take from chapters like Hosea 9 is that all of Israel is rotten. Right, <laughs> right. Um, and I think that's where I can see myself in, in, in chapter 9 of Hosea is, my gosh, you know, God comes to me in my filth and my wretchedness and says, what is, what, what is the sin? And, and then strangely, I have, I have you know, I, have, I, I, I say, amen. Amen. It is so. We just had this last week, the, the Canaanite woman uh, and Jesus. And of course, Jesus calls her, that's the text where Jesus calls her a dog. And she says exactly that. Amen. It is so. I am a dog, but even the dogs take the crumbs from the, t- from the, from the table or from the master's table. Meaning, even those who eat at the table are being given bread from God, as much as the dogs are being bre- given bread from God. And all of this, all these good gifts from, from, come from God himself. But that's so juxtaposed to what we see in verse 12. Because ultimately what Yahweh is saying is, is that, okay, what you want is for me not to be around. What you want is not mercy because you say you're not sinful. So then he says in that last line, woe to them when I depart from them. Because he provides protection, he provides guidance, he provides care, he provides certainty, he provides hope, he provides all these things. And yet what they're saying as they are willingly departing from, from him, from Yahweh, is that only woe will come to you because I am not there to protect you because you've said that you do not want protection. It's a stark verse, chapter 12 is. And, and, and Pastor Boo, and, and for those who are listening, this is the very th- same thing that we have to be cognizant of our day, is that as we continue to say that we do not want God around, we have to understand that God has a history of listening. Yeah, right. He gives us what we want. Yes, he will give us to what it is that we want with the results of what we see in verse 11, no birth, no pregnancy, no conception, and that the people of, of Ephraim will be giving their, their own children into the hands of murderers. And, you know, I, I, I think it goes without saying, you don't even need to bring abortion up, but I think we do um, mm-hmm. in, in that particular sense. But we, 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 we believe it's good because the society and the world and the devil say that it is. And the reality is, is that um, it, it, it's bringing only woe um, and continued separation from our Lord. Let's add the rest of the verses while we have just a few minutes left in the program, starting verses 15 through 17, the end of the chapter. Here we go. Every evil of theirs is in Gilgal. There I began to hate them because of the wickedness of their deeds. I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. All their princes are rebels. Ephraim is stricken. Their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. Even though they give birth, I will put their beloved children to death. My God will reject them because they have not listened to him. They shall be wanderers among the nations. Okay, so uh, a couple of things. <laughs> the, the first of which is, um, I know you'll give us a little background on what we're talking about with Gilgal, but uh, there I began to hate them. Uh, he's speaking for God. Isn't God a God of love? What, what's going on, right? Yeah, that, that word too is it goes back to Jacob and Esau. It, it's Jacob I've loved, Esau I've hated. Is you know this isn't you know I don't know what the the contemporary soap operas are, but I guess all television is soap operas now. Um, you know, it's just to say it's not hatred in the way that we understand hatred. It's to say um, to Israel has been given to Jacob most specifically has been given the promise um, of of being the ones who will be the heritage and the lineage of of the Messiah. 
Um, and so I began to hate them there is not to say that God disliked them or, or didn't love them. He didn't cease to love them. Uh, it's just to say um, that what they were doing is they were acting as if they were not his children. And I think that's the most important thing is, is that his hatred is as a result of the, the, the failure of the, of the people of Ephraim to listen to him. Um, and so Gilgal, basically just the history of that, it goes back to Joshua 4. That's the first place that circumcision happened. But then most prominently, and this, this is where it fits in with our, with our verse in 15, is this is where, remember in, in, in 1 Samuel, I think it's chapter 8, where the people of Israel are, are, are requesting that they would have a king like others. And of course, this is granted to them. Um, but then once we get to 1 Samuel 13, we see Saul, um, who <laughs> takes some liberties that are not given to him. This goes back to this understanding of divine worship in divine service. God wishes to be found where he says that he can be found. And so what happens is Saul usurps the, the, basically the authority of the priest. God becomes angry with him at that time because it was not given to Saul, the king, to do this. It was given to the prophet. It, it was given to the priest to be able to, to offer the sacrifices. And so what you see basically there is Saul starting to take liberties that are not afforded to him. Um, and then the other thing too, I'll drive them from my house. And this isn't specifically talking about the temple. When, when God's speaking here about my house, he's saying the whole land, the whole land that I've given to you as a gift, I'm going to drive you from the land because it's mine. Um, I will love them no more. And that doesn't, once again, that's not to say um, that his love for them is, is you know, we, his love is known for us, obviously, in, in his sacrifice, most apparently known in the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ for us. Um, uh, this isn't necessarily saying I won't love them as my children, but they're not acting as my children. Um, the princes are rebellious. And, and so Saul uh, was the first of which, and there would be many more, <laughs> right. many, many more who would come uh, after him. Um, and in Ephraim, the Northern kingdom will be stricken. The root is dried up. This brings us back sort of to the stump of Jesse where we, and, and the prophet at Hosea too, is that, the world accounts these, you know, these prophets and even our Lord in, in the days of his ministry as an old washed up, dried up, you know, little stump. Isaiah 53 really talks about this very well. We, we accounted him as nothing. We saw no beauty in him. We walked over him and disregarded him. And, 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 and what's happening here is even though this is the case, um, that Ephraim, the Northern kingdom, the people of God are going to dry up, um, still our Lord is going to provide a savior for them. Um, they're, they're not going to bear any fruit. And this is a good thing uh, because the fruit that they're bearing is bad. <laughs> right. Um, were they to bear children, I would kill the darlings of their womb. Um, so this is where we see, you know, in terms of the, the, the Decalogue, most specifically in the, in the summary of the 10 commandments, the children are going to die because of the sins of the parents and the destruction is going to be total. And I think about that, you know, with regard to what we understand with regard to holy baptism. Um, my, my parents and, and, and whatnot are bringing me to be given life at this font by virtue of, by virtue of word and water, um, life that only God can give being raised from the death of original sin and, and, and the propitiation and the forgiveness of all actual sins. God alone gives me life. And I think that's the major point here is that it's not the parents who will give life. It's not the kingdom that's going to give them life. It's not even the children who will find their identities and make themselves a life. I, God, will give them life. Um, and then verse 17 sort of caps it off. My God will cast them away uh, because they did not. And the New King James Version says obey. But I think the best translation of that is they didn't listen. They didn't hear him. So recall that they had no need for mercy as such that they will receive no mercy. So they wanted no mercy and God gave them precisely what they wanted. And that's, I think, the most stark thing that this particular chapter is, is it will then give way to chapter 10, which you'll cover uh, soon, um, is, is basically saying, okay, you'll have no homeland. You're going to be wanderers. You're going to be dispersed first by Assyria, then from Babylon. Uh, and you'll be fulfilling the words that were spoken to Moses that apostasy would cause God to scatter his people. And, and, and the, the, the beauty of all this in the midst of all of this law, and it is heavy is the fact that God continues to be faithful to his promises. Not promises of judgment necessarily upon his people, but ultimately understood in his judgment that will be rendered upon Jesus for the sake and the benefit of all of his people 
who will unite both the northern and the southern kingdom, again, as the book of Jeremiah talks about, but not just the northern and the southern kingdom, but all the Gentiles as well. All of these promises are there, and to remember that God, who is faithful to his promises, uh, will be faithful to his people, uh, because that's part of what the promises uh, entail for us. It's a beautiful, beautiful, um, uh, you know, not, not a glimmer of hope, but a bright ray of hope that exists in what is a very, very terrible time for the northern king of Israel. Well, that's where we'll have to end it for today. But as always, I'd like to thank my guest, the Reverend Adam DeGroat, pastor of Calvary Lutheran Church in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. As always, Pastor, I love hearing you explain all of this deep text for us. You're a blessing to the show. I can't wait to have you back on. The peace of the Lord be with you. It was a pleasure to be with you today. Thanks. Folks, tomorrow, as he said, we'll continue the same prophecy with the second half as it comes to us in chapter 10. It continues God's warning of impending doom for Israel. The prophet describes their idolatry and unfaithfulness as the root cause of their destruction. And of course, he urges them to turn away from the false gods and back to the one true God. So until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word.